Secretary General Bond, Madam Yo, it is my honor to welcome you to Boston University and to the inaugural celebration of the opening of Boston University's newest research center, the Global Development Policy Center, or as we call it, the GDP. <laughs> the GDP is the newest of our 11 university-wide centers of excellence. Our university provost, Jean Morrison, who we've met, and Vice President for Research, Gloria Waters, as well as Dean Adil Najam of the Pardee School for Global Studies, all saw that global development policy was a domain in which we had tremendous interdisciplinary strength and that if we created the right platform for collaboration, we could contribute more effectively to addressing the challenges of development around the world and better train graduate students to participate in this important work. I am particularly enthusiastic about the GDP as our colleague Kevin Gallagher has conceived of it. Not only will the center bring together scholars and students from across the university schools and colleges to conduct research on what take, it takes to achieve financial stability, human development, and environmental sustainability around the globe, but the GDP will also engage in active policy dialogue with public officials, for profit, the for-profit sector, and non-government organizations to turn ideas into action. I'm pleased to introduce Professor Kevin Gallagher, who will share his vision for the GDP with you and introduce the Secretary General. Kevin is Professor of Global Policy, uh, Development Policy at the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies. He has published six books since coming to Boston University and numerous scholarly articles in economics, political science, and law journals that are cited widely across academic fields. He has been a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in China and at the Paul Knights School for Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. In 2008, with the help of the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and the Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future at Boston University, Professor Gallagher established the Global Economic Governance Initiative, a policy research lab that examined the role that economic institutions play in fostering economic development globally. Most recently, Kevin has, was appointed to the co-chair of the G20 Task Force on an International Financial Architecture for Stability and Development. We're very, very proud to have Kevin on our faculty and to lead this initiative. Kevin? Thank you, President Brown. Uh, President Brown, Boston University students, alumni, friends, and our, of course, our distinguished guests, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Madam Yu, his wife. Uh, it's with a great honor to stand before you as the inaugural director of the Global Development Policy Center here at Boston University. Please allow me to say a few words about the origins and vision of the center, and then I'll introduce our distinguished guests. The GDP Center might be a new center here at Boston University, but policy-oriented research on development issues is something that BU's been a center of excellence on for a long time. Fifty years ago, the late Paul Rosenstein Rodin left MIT and brought a whole bunch of other folks from Harvard over here to establish a center of excellence in development economics at Boston University. Those efforts left a legacy that continues to be built upon to this day. Rosenstein Rodin and his colleagues advised presidents in the United States and abroad on a number of development strategies, and their work still remains at the core of just about every development economics textbook across the world. When Paul Streeton taught here, he established the journal World Development, which is now the leading interdisciplinary journal in scholarly circles on development issues. Streeton and colleagues also helped devise the United Nations uh, Human Development Reports and the Human Development Indicators, which are key indicators for us to help measure our progress towards our development goals. John Harris, who I hope is here tonight, uh, this morning, <laughs> is uh, uh, his article on the, on the determinants of migration and urban unemployment in poorer countries was chosen by Nobel Prize winners as one of the top economics papers of the 20th century. In more recent decades, the Department of Economics and its Institute for Economic Development is doing path-breaking behavioral approaches that continue to build and advance on this great legacy. 
Boston University School of Public Health, or SPH as we call it, also continues to make major contributions, uh, especially in, but not limited to, its Department of Global Health. Research ge generated by scholars in SPH led to UN AIDS resetting global guidelines for breastfeeding among HIV-infected mothers across the world. SPH teams provided key evidence that led to a major change in guidelines at the World Health Organization for treatment for pneumonia in poor children. The development group at SPH currently works closely with the government of South Africa to make their drug policies to combat HIV AIDS more effective, and those are just a handful of the incredible things that they're doing over there. Here at the Questrom School, which is on the bottom floors of, of this building, they uh, will celebrate 40 years of a Hubert Humphrey pro Fellows Program, which is a young professionals program for folks from emerging market and developing country finance ministers, ministries, central banks, and the private sector who come to BU for a year. One of the most distinguished alums from that program, Jin Lachun, is now the president of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and he'll join the GDP Center in Washington, D.C. on April 18th at the Council on Foreign Relations, where we'll have another uh, opening ceremony for the center. You're all invited if you want to come down to Washington in April. The relatively new Frederick S. Pardee School for, the, for Global Studies has put advancing human progress and development at the core of its mission. In 2012, scholars from the Pardee School published research and established a task force with the Pardee Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future that contributed to a major policy change at the International Monetary Fund that allows emerging market and developing countries to establish innovative policies to prevent and mitigate financial crises. The Party School also houses an innovative cross-university master's program that links the School of Public Health, the Economics Department, and the Earth and Environment Department to create future leaders in global development policy and global development diplomacy. Of course, many other schools, colleges, departments, and scholars here at BU have also made incredible contributions to this issue, and we look forward to working with all of you. Our alumni are also finance ministers, scholars, private business leaders, and community advocates across the world. And I'm really proud to say that our trustees are real leaders on these issues. On December 7, 2017, the trustees of Boston University approved a climate action plan that aims to reduce net emissions to zero by 2040, which is quicker than the city of Boston's pledge. As thanks to President Brown's leadership, Boston University was invited to join the Association of American Universities, or AAU, the group of the most distinguished research universities in North America. We became a distinguished research university not only because the president's team has amplified the many peaks of excellence that we have here across the university, but also because he's fostered these 11 centers that he talked about, the university-wide centers that have helped BU faculty reach for even higher goals than we can achieve in our own labs, in our own departments. The GDP Center is honored to be one of these new centers, and I look forward to working with my colleagues and learning from all of you on how to work on these issues. While we're, also, while we're a university-wide center, like some of the other university-wide centers, the GDP Center is also associated with a particular school. Uh, we, are housed, we are housed with the Part E School for obvious reasons, as I mentioned before, that the core mission is to advance human progress. I sincerely thank Gloria Waters, the Vice President and Associate Provost for Research and her excellent team. I thank Adel Najam, the Dean of the Pardee School, and Provost Jean Morrison, and of course the President for the faith, support, and guidance they've provided to the establishment of this center. So what's the center going to be all about? Uh, our mission is to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and environmental integrity across the world. To that end, we have established three research initiatives that bring together faculty and graduate students from economics, law, public health, business, political science, history, earth and environment, engineering, and global studies. The first is the Land Use and Livelihoods Initiative. It examines the impacts of international institutions, domestic politics, and local practices on ecosystems and human well-being in regions with commodity-based resource extraction. The group's initial projects will examine the extent to which consumer decisions in Europe and China impact farmers, indigenous people, biodiversity, and climate change in the Brazilian Amazon. The second initiative is the Human Capital Initiative, which examines how global challenges such as poverty alleviation, women's empowerment, and sustainable economic growth can be addressed through investments in education and health. 
Some of their first projects are to analyze and improve the experiences of Indonesian migrants when they go abroad, and we'll be hosting a conference at the GDP Center later this semester on the economics of HIV AIDS. The Global Economic Governance Initiative is the third initiative we have at the center that examines the extent to which international institutions foster financial stability, human well-being, and the environment. The group has a project with scholars at the School of Public Health that examines the impacts of intellectual property provisions and trade treaties on access to essential medicines in Chile. We're also working with the United Nations uh, and other partners to examine the extent to which development banks can be key tools towards achieving the sustainable development goals in the Paris Climate Commitments. And finally, with the Earth and Environment Department, the group is building a global database to analyze China's new ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. Indeed, the role of China in the world economy is one of the cross-cutting issues uh, across the center's different in initiatives. Thanks to foundation support from the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and others, the GDP Center has set up partnerships with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, the P K Peking University, and a number of uh, research institutes in host countries that are big recipients of Chinese finance across the world. This semester, we're hosting a China Global Research Colloquium, which is organized by PhD students that we're supporting and housing from Boston University, from the University of Washington, from Cornell University, and from Princeton. In addition to that experiential learning, we've just launched a competition, check your inboxes, students that are in there, out here, uh, called for a summer in the field program. We'll send BU graduate students to developing countries to, to conduct field work and attach yourselves to development organizations on the ground. What will mark, as President Brown said, what will mark the GDP Center from others in academia is that we are not only going to be a university-based think tank that does cutting-edge interdisciplinary research that publishes it in the top journals, which we do and we will continue to do, but we will also strive to be a do-tank that embeds itself in policy discussions and engages policymakers in the global public. As early recognition of this effort, the GDP Center has been chosen to co-chair a G20 task force on think tanks on international financial institutions for stability and development. When Dean DeJam and I were discussing how to commemorate this new center, the first person that came to mind was the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon. After 37 years of serving in Republic of Korea's foreign ministry, his last po post being the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ban Ki-moon became the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, serving from 2007 to 2016. Through his tenure at the United Nations, the Secretary General was known to be a bridge builder, a voice for the world's poorest and most vulnerable, and for working to make the United Nations more transparent and effective in all of its operations. Secretary General Bond played key roles in multilateral approaches to mitigating the global financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. He helped usher in the incredible sustainable development goals, which in some ways will be a guidepost for our center. And obviously, and perhaps, uh, perhaps significantly, the Paris Climate Agreement, the groundbreaking climate agreement that brings all the nations of the world on a path towards mitigating the global climate crisis. Since January 2018, Secretary General Bonn, along with the former President of Austria, has been inducted as co-chair of the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens in Vienna, Austria. And he's also the honorary chairman of the Institute of Global Engagement and Empowerment at Yonsei University in his country. In many ways, there's no better person on earth that embodies the mission and goals of our center. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Professor Robert Brown, the president of Boston University, Provost Ken Morrison, Vice President, Honorable Mr. Kim Yong Hyun, Consul General of the Republic of Korea in Boston, Professor Kevin Gallagher, Director of the Global Development Policy Center, and Dean Adil Najam, esteemed professors, dear students, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
It's a great honor and privilege for me to participate in this inaugural opening of Global Development Center in Boston University. I'm also excited to be back to uh, Boston City uh, today. This is such a special and historical American city. Boston is energized by the dynamic students and faculty populations as well as its culture and world famous uh, sports teams in Boston. <laughs> in particular, it's my great honor and privilege again to deliver this keynote speech on this very important and auspicious occasion, which is very special uh, to me uh, when you are establishing this global development center, policy center. This is what uh, I have been encouraging many people around the world, including educational institutions like Boston University. I really thank uh, President Robert Brown and Director Kevin Gallagher uh, of this uh, center for inviting me to this uh, important occasion of the inaugural ceremony. I applaud the vision and leadership of Brown University for maximizing its intellectual resources for the benefit of the people and in addressing global challenges and creating global public goods through the GDP center. The opening of this center is particularly timely at this critical juncture for our world and collective future. The GDP Center is expected to endeavor to promote important policy-oriented research on essential international issues. Uh, this research includes financial stability, human well-being, and environmental sustainability. And I'd like to uh, express my uh, sincere congratulations on this initiative. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and nowadays, we all find ourselves in the midst of an era of uh, global change, a dizzying technological advancement in internet and artificial intelligence, and the advent of uh, era of uh, fourth industrial revolution, revolution are altering how we live and work whether we will really be able to overcome or control this uh, speed and magnitude of our transformative technological uh, development. At the same time, because of this, there is a general sense of uncertainty and insecurity caused by the very transformational technological development which our human being has achieved. Yet, despite this, tempestuous times and challenges that we face, I see a great amount of progress and hope in working together to forge a sustainable uh, future. Much of this progress is grounded in the work of partnership and cooperation to achieve our development goals. And much of this hope is driven by my belief uh, in youth and women empowerment, uh, particularly uh, students here, uh, for their future and for their action and in engagement. And therefore, I firmly believe that we must remain committed to our international system rooted in multilateral situations such as the United Nations, with which I have had the privilege and honor to serve. During my tenure, tenure as a UN Secretary General, I strive to exercise my global leadership duties by leveraging the power of partnership. I believe that the opening of this Global Development Center is also owing to great partnership you have been uh, forging. This is important uh, since the United Nations and its member states can no longer bear these responsibilities alone in our rapidly changing, changing world. I have been always emphasizing that however powerful country or resourceful the United States may be, 
There is no country, no individual in this world who can do it alone. So we need to have a united the commitment as well as a strong partnership, which you are excellently showing uh, this morning. As everybody, want, everybody knows, United Nations was founded in 1945 after tragic, disastrous, in the history of human being, of the Second World War. The New York Times one day published, I think a few years published, the most atrocious, tragic things which happened in the history of human being. The number one stands, the Second World War, Second World War, where six, more than 60 million people have been killed. No wars, no conflict has ever caused that many tragic, tragic death in the history of humankind, including many thousand, millennium years. There we learned a lot. United Nations was found simply to prevent occurrence of such kind of a tragedy in the future. I think United Nations has been successful despite many, many criticisms during the last 73 years. At least, at least we have been able to prevent such tragic war like the Second World War, even though we are troubled with the continuing conflicts in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya, and elsewhere. And even at this moment, many people are killed without any reasons by extremists, by terrorists, and by, again, the natural disasters, which we are going to discuss. Because of that, the alternative was anchored by the guiding belief that diplomacy and cooperation offered the international community a better way for resolving all this conflict. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I will speak to you about how we can advance and also flourish in this era of increased global uncertainty and insecurity. We can achieve this goal through sound policies, power of cooperation and partnership, and the driving sense of global citizenship. We must all play our part in this process, particularly young people such as you and leading academic institutions such as Boston University and the GDP Center if we are to succeed together. Having said this, I'd like to discuss with you just the three three major issues. First, I will discuss the great necessity of achieving our Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. And second, I will address, as a part of this SDGs, more particularly on the issue of climate change. And third, I will speak about the need for scaled up youth participation and the role of global citizenship in forging a more sustainable, peaceful, and prosperous future for all. Esteemed professors, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, we have taken significant leaps forward in the field of global development in recent years. The international community guided by the United Nations Millennium Development Goals which met its target year in 2015, has undoubtedly improved human well-being. Extreme poverty rate has been cut in half by 2010. The World Bank, in fact, uh, proudly announced five years before the target year of 2015 that the number one goal of MDG, the extreme poverty, has been halved. But that was mostly owing to Chinese government strong commitment and drive uh, to cut their extreme poverty uh, people. Chinese people, they still have, they still have uh, many uh, million, uh, tens of millions of people still suffering from this extreme poverty. But by lifting 
more than 450 million Chinese people, the world looked like that we have been successful. But still, look around. There is almost uh, more than 700 million people are still going to bed with their hungry stomach. There are still uh, 6 million children before they reach five years, fifth birthday, they die needlessly without any reason because of lack of support, lack of sanitation, lack of uh, safe uh, drinking water. While we have been able to support all these people, almost one, mil one billion people, still we have almost 1.2 billion people who lack safe drinking water and sanitation. We have 1.4 billion people who, who has to do everything without electricity, under candlelight. These are what we are experiencing. Inequality is also growing both between and within nations. Since 2000, 50% of the increase in global wealth only benefited the top 1% of the world's population. More jarring, the only 42, 42 individuals, rich people, like some Warren Buffett or Billy, all these people, Bill Gates, 40 rich people hold as much wealth as the 3.7 billion people. How nice all these people enjoying that wealth. 3.7 billion means half the population of our world. This is purely injustice and inequality. This is what SDG is really trying to abolish and change the situation. During my two term as a Secretary General of the UN, I'm proud to have prioritized and expanded the importance of United Nations global development efforts. The 2030 Agenda and SDGs is one of the United Nations most significant, most ambitious, most far-reaching vision the United Nations has presented ever. Uh, to humankind, human being. In that regard, I, I'm very much grateful for this GDP center. Whether you check GDP or whatever, <laughs> I was a little bit confused. <laughs> Is uh, Boston University going to have their own GDP calculation, whatever? <laughs> but in any way, it's important to have some indexes. The SDG has uh, 17 goals. Now, it has uh, more than 230 indexes. indexes. Therefore, I hope the GDP Center will also work uh, how to uh, gauge, how to measure the level of uh, development and achievement and implementation of SDGs uh, through this uh, GDP, uh, GDP Center. This was, as everyone knows, 193 all the member states have fully uh, supported. And Pope Francis was also deeply involved and fully, fully supported. And I have had a very close relationship with him. And he came to the United Nations to give spiritual blessings on SDGs. Normally, Vatican does not involve in detailed things which is, not hap which is happening on the earth. They only ma maintain what's happening in the heaven. But he came for the second time, first time in the history of the popular history, second time. One, there is no pope who has ever visited twice to the United Nations except him, Pope Francis. I'm very much uh, grateful. Therefore, it is important, imperative, that whether you are working in the government or institutions of higher learning or civil society, business communities, we must do all what 
which we have to do to implement all these uh, 17 goals. There are again 169 targets. targets. These 17 goals are not just uh, on the paper. They have all targets. Each goal has uh, several targets, altogether 169. Each goal has indexes against which we will measure. This was not done by the United Nations. And these were done by world's top economists, scientists, statist statistic uh, specialists. So it is the work of the best people, the brightest people have made this one. Now it's up to us, up to you, to carry on this one. So let's work together on this matter. In this regard, I'm proud to have expanded the United Nations partnership efforts in academic institutions. In 2010, I realized that without quality education and without the participation of uh, educational institutions of uh, higher learning, like uh, Boston University, we will not be able to do that. Therefore, I launched in 2010 what is known as United Nations Academic Impact, UNAI. I sincerely hope that if uh, BU has not joined it, please join it. It's a United Nations-led initiative with 1,500 world-class universities are joining, and their president, their pro professors, and students are working together as a part of this Sustainable Development Goals and Climate Change. Educational institutions and research centers are essential partners in our quest to achieve SDGs and climate change. They serve as launch pads for new ideas and incubators to forge solutions to the seemingly insurmountable uh, problems that we face. In that regard, I am pleased to see that initial initiative of Boston University's GDP Center fit seamlessly into this paradigm as they are related to human capital, land, livelihoods, and global governance. Such partnership initiatives can facilitate the transfer of knowledge, advance critical research, and help instill a driving sense of sustainability in the global citizens of tomorrow. I view this GDP Center as a textbook example of the power of partnership in action that we must maintain our forward momentum together. In this regard, I'd like to introduce my engagement, as was introduced by Professor Gallagher. I have established the Ban Gimel Center for Sustainable Development in Yonsei University in Seoul as a part of Institute of Global Engagement and Empowerment. And I have also established the Ban Gimel Center for Global Citizens, as I believe that global citizenship fostered by these institutions of higher learning will be critically important. What I have observed during my 10 years at the United Nations is that most of the conflicts have been caused not by the people. They are largely caused by the leadership people. Well, leadership people do not respect the United Nations Charter, human rights, human dignity, basic rules and rules of our operations and lives. And then some concerns and grievances brewing up, and these are led normally into conflicts within countries and among and between and among countries. This is simply because they lack global citizenship. They lack global vision. Many leaders come to the United Nations. When they 
stand in the podium, they say always a beautiful, visionary, very strong commitment. I will work for world peace and security and human rights. Once they fly back to their country, they just forget whatever they said just a few days ago at that United Nations. This is what I have been witnessing and experiencing, which made me very sad. That's why I have always been urging that leaders must have global citizenship and practice it themselves, lead by example. But you don't find many leaders who lead by example in their countries, in their leadership. So my motto as a Secretary General has always been lead by example. Before you tell somebody to do this and that, you must do it first and show your example, leadership. This is what professors should do. Professors, instead of teaching knowledge, knowledge may, may be outdated by tomorrow because of this uh, changing situations and transformative development of technologies. But what is more important is to foster global citizenship for the young uh, students who will become leaders of tomorrow. Now, the other aspect of our global sustainable development is peace and security. The United Nations has uh, three pillars in the charter, peace and security, development, and human rights. All these uh, three pillars are interconnected. Nothing is more Im important over another. They are equally important. But when there is no peace and security in your country, in your community, then people cannot engage in development. People's human rights cannot be respected. Just in front of gunpoints, you cannot just claim that I have a human rights. So we have to make sure that everybody can live peace in peace and security. Unfortunately, we are still seeing a lot of conflicts taking place even at this moment. We have seen, amidst, amidst of all these concerns, we have seen some small signs of reconciliation and peace on the Korean Peninsula, where I am from. Through this uh, Winter Olympic Games, we were able to promote much better reconciliations between South and North, while still international community are deeply concerned about continuing North Korean provocation through nuclear weapons as well as ballistic missiles intercontinental, including intercontinental. But at least at this time, it would be extremely important, not only for Korean people, but for the people of the world, that we show, they show, a sense of urgency, with a sense of urgency, to engage in more genuine, genuine and constructive and meaningful dialogue. This is my a sincere wish as a former Secretary General, and also as one of the citizens of South Korea. And we need strong support of the United States. We need support of China, Russia, Japan, European Union, and many countries should chip in their effort. Particularly, the United States can play a very important role together with the Chinese who has been traditionally a strong uh, supporters of North Korea. China can have a much stronger leverage against North Korea. So let us work together, not only for the peace on the Korean Peninsula, but for the peace of world, as well as sustainable development of our uh, society. This is what I'm really asking you as institution of higher learning. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, just address uh, some other very important issues on climate change. I'm known normally as uh, Mr. Climate. They address me like that. This, 
I accept it with a great uh, honor. Even this morning, before coming to this place, I engaged one hour video conference with the president of World Bank, and my predecessor, Kofi Annan, Secretary General, and two other distinguished climate leaders, Christiana Figueres, who used to work as Executive Secretary of UNFCCC, and one uh, very important business person from Europe. We talked a lot about how we can make sure that Paris Climate Change Agreement, which was adopted with uh, so much difficulty, so much sensitivity. We must mobilize, first of all, financial support for many developing countries, many developing countries who do not have any means to mitigate and adapt to this uh, changing situation. It is largely being caused by human behavior, but mostly by Europeans and Americans, and including maybe Japanese and South Koreans. All these uh, rapidly developing countries, including China too. Now we must make sure that uh, these, those developing countries who have been affected without, doing, without causing anything should be, if not compensated, we have to assist them so that they will be able to overcome. Now China is on board. United, United States led the championing role together with the China. Without China and United States, President Obama and President Xi Jinping, and United Nations, I think this climate change agreement could not have been possible. Now, I am concerned that one of uh, such a championing country is now stepping back from this Paris Agreement. Th I don't know how we can explain. There's only one country. <laughs> but one country is, again, most important country. That's a problem now. This was signed by even, I'm just uh, joking and saying, even by North Korea, <laughs> even by Syria, Libya, Yemen. There is no country which has not signed on this earth. Of course, the US is a signatory. Uh, President Trump, that they would withdraw this. This withdrawal has not been effective. They have to wait three more years to be effective. It's not too late. They, will, they are welcome to come back anytime. <laughs> but I hope uh, the many professors here who are experts in climate change, instead of my saying, I, I can give you some one, one uh, you know, tip, uh, one, one quote maybe. This is a politically short-sighted, politically short-sighted vision. This is economically, again, irresponsible, irresponsible. U.S. takes at least one-third of all these responsibilities. Scientifically wrong, scientifically wrong. I'm afraid that United States and people may stand in the wrong side of history in the future, if they do not return as soon as possible. So why, why don't you write the articles and op-eds, you know? <laughs> I, I may not be able to do that. Uh, instead, uh, I'm speaking in front of you in a very close session. But scholars, you know, you are free. And students, you are free to speak to your senators and governors and mayors. But just make sure that make this world where I'm living, where my succeeding generations will be living, environmentally sustainable, socially inclusive. I think this should be done by all the people working together in partnership. Now you are living in very one of the most prosperous and beautiful state of Massachusetts, New England, 
Warming planet is also contributing to the frequency and in, in, intensity of the major nor'easter and hurricanes that storm through New England multiple times a year. So we must take the necessary steps to combat climate change immediately. If we don't, you will have to regret for our succeeding generations. We have only one, one planet. This is the planet which we have to nurture, we have to care. If we don't care, then nature will go its own way. I have been always saying that nature does not wait for human being. As a human society, which has to live harmoniously with this nature, nature does not wait for us. They go there on their own course. We have to accommodate ourselves, have wisdom to live harmoniously uh, with the nature. That is what I am really emphasizing. In fact, this was one of my proudest achievements during my time as a Secretary General. But now, out of this office, I can only ask my successor, Secretary General, I can only ask the leaders of this world, and I can only ask young students. I think you have to speak out. You have to speak out to your community leaders. I must take this opportunity again to strongly urge you uh, to do whatever you, are, you can do. While I am very much concerned, I am also uh, quite encouraged by what is happening in the United States from the grassroots, from the political level even. The campaign which is known as we are still in, we are still in. The many governors of this country, like California, Oregon, Washington, including Massachusetts, at least 12 states, governors have declared, and at least 200 mayors of the United States, and at least 900 big business firms, they announced that we will go, we will join. We are still in this campaign to address the climate change. This is quite welcoming. The Governor Jerry Brown is going to host his own summit meeting in September this year. This is, uh, great. this is going to be a great opportunity to make sure that United States continue to lead this campaign together with China. If China and the United States are there, I think they, we, can, we can make it happen. There are many countries who still need to be part, but I think they are all on, they are all on board. Ladies and gentlemen, during my time as UN Secretary General, I understood again another important issue, the power of young people and also women. Combining the population of women and young people, uh, for those from under the age of 25 of young people, both men and women, and women all together, it is 75% of global population, so four-thirds. So it's a great, uh, um, great uh, population, which really takes uh, this world. But in most cases, the women's and young people's opportunities have not been given properly and fairly. There are more women in terms of the uh, exact number of global population, more than 50%. Then if we do not give more to the women, then at least they should be given half, 50%. So this world should be 50-50. That's a basic philosophical commitment of SDGs. Make sure that by 2030, this world is 50-50. Now, largely, the voice of young people have been, have been just uh, not been appreciated. 
There are many people, young people, who have taken leadership today already. We normally call them, you are going to take charge of this world from tomorrow. Of course, most of the case, it may be true. But there are many leadership people at this time, today. Therefore, we have to care much about uh, their voices, their social and political uh, opportunities. This is uh, very important because you are one of the highest learning institutions. So you are the one who really uh, train and educate uh, these young people to make sure that they will really take better charge of our society. So we must do more to engage and empower these two groups as they are the enablers to achieve our sustainable development and climate change issues. By doing so, we can help unlock their unbridled potential as the agents of change and dynamic global citizens of today and tomorrow. Global citizenship is an important concept that can serve as a unique tool to help solve some of our most pressing challenges and help, help us reach our global targets. Global citizens are those who identify themselves not as a citizen of a certain country, but as a citizen of this world. So I'm asking you, uh, particularly young people, don't care too much about your passports you are carrying. Your citizenship is just for administrative purpose. <laughs> you are coming from Korea or Japan, China or America, like this way. This world is a very small, small planet world with the transformative development of communication, transportation, technologies, nanotechnologies. I think we are living in a very small world. So we are global citizens. Therefore, I, I really hope that young people particularly have a global citizenship and global visions, not like, unlike uh, your leadership uh, around the world. Establish long-term solution. We need inclusive and participatory action from young global citizens as an essential ingredient to leverage the great potential of partnership that I spoke already. So for this reason, I have been trying my best to help elevate global citizenship as a driving vision for young people around the world. As I said, that is why I have established the last month in Vienna, Austria, Van Gemmel Center for Global Citizens. This may be a small one, but I'm going to expand, and I'm ready to have a partnership with this uh, university and other, other partners. Alongside the United Nations and the private sector and other key stakeholders, I see Boston University's GDP Center and also Yonsei University where I, I work, like a global engagement and empowerment center, Pangemon Center for Sustainable Development, we can become natural allies uh, working uh, together. Esteemed professors, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to conclude my remarks by saying that despite the challenges we currently face, if we join together, in strong partnerships and move forward as global citizens, we can achieve our global goals and create a better uh, future. When I assumed my job in 2007, I promised that I will make this world better for all. At the end of my term, I was not able to say that I made it happen. Unfortunately, I have to leave it, this baton to my a successor to you. Now it's in your hands to work together to make this world better. To do this, I humbly ask you all to harness your vision, global vision, 
have worked to prioritize global action. Look outside your boundaries. So look beyond your United States. Look at other places, how they are doing. You will only be very sad to realize that there are so many people who need our support, who need our compassionate leadership. I'm asking young people here, it's your prerogative to be passionate. There is nobody here who doesn't have passion. But if you do not have compassion together with the passion, I'm afraid that your future will not be as constructive, your future will not be as a global citizen. So passion and compassion, that should always come together. Dear students, you hold the keys to unlock a more sustainable, peaceful, and prosperous world. You are the innovators, the change makers, the leaders, and the global citizens of our world. Today and tomorrow, play your part in helping advance the United Nations global development, sustainable development, climate change agreement. We only have one planet. Therefore, there should be no plan B. We don't have planet B. Only natural that we don't have plan B. There is only plan, plan A. Your voices, dear young student, your voices are stronger than you may think. So raise your voice as a global citizen. Ladies and gentlemen, I will leave you with the words of a Boston Celtics legend player, Larry Bird. <laughs> I put, push yourself again and again. Don't give an inch until the final Puja sounds, unquote. So please push yourselves and human, humanities forward again and again through sustained efforts, guided with a passionate and compassionate global partnership. And I'm confident that working together, we will be able to make this world better for all, not only for us, for our succeeding generation. Let's work together, and thank you for your leadership and commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Terrific remarks, Mr. Climate. <laughs> the Secretary General has agreed to uh, have a, converse, a short conversation with us for a little while. I'm going to take the prerogative and ask the first question. Um, and then we'll take a couple questions, and I'll ask the Secretary General to reply to them in, in bulk. And the first two questions are going to definitely come from students. So start thinking about your question now. Uh, Secretary General. The, you were present at the creation of so many fundamental multilateral moments that we've had in the 21st century, helping to prevent and mitigate the, uh, to mitigate the financial crisis, the sustainable development goals that you talked about so much, and you earned the title Mr. Climate for helping be part of the landmark Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, we live in a world where some days it seems like it's difficult for one country to agree on anything at home. Uh, and even more difficult for two countries to agree on something. How did over almost 200 countries agree to these major milestone sets of goals for the 21st century? What does it take? We have lots of people here who want to go out and, uh, and advance these kind of goals moving forward. What are, what are the ingredients of bringing the world's people together on such ambitious goals? That will take some time, but... Uh... <laughs> You did both of them in one year. The Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement were both in 2015. Uh, if I explain like this way, there are many rules or procedures in any meetings, any uh, companies. Normally, rules or procedures is that the decision is made by majority. If uh, more important decisions should be made two-thirds majority. But there are not many cases 
when you, you need absolutely 100%, 100% decision, like a consensus, unanimity, uh, people mix up. But when it comes to absolute unanimity, means out of 197 state parties, just one country could kill this Paris Agreement. It happened in Paris. It might have happened unless we really, you know, pressed hard to twist the neck, etc. Like <laughs> one country, Nicaragua, at the last minute when we were about to gavel, to say not officially, silently, well, I would not be able to support it. As a different, I'm not able to support or I will not make, even though I do not agree, I will just be silent. So John Kerry and myself and President Hollande and Angela Merkel, Prime Minister, and everybody just scrambled <laughs> and tried to twist the arms and whatever was possible. But finally, fortunately, they said, OK, we will we'll just you know, not say no. Uh, just to keep silent. That's why we have a Paris Agreement. If we try for a second time, I have no confidence whether it will happen again. That's why it's important that the United States should come back. You know, they are still in, but they are still in, uh, legally speaking. Now, then to make it happen, to make it possible among 197, as I said earlier, I really wanted to show my leadership by example. Uh, first of all, I need to be armed myself. I need to know what's happening. So I traveled all throughout the world to see for myself. It started from Antarctica and twice North Arctic. So it's a very difficult. You have to mobilize a lot of things. You cannot just go as you ski somewhere. <laughs> have you? Any one of you been to Arctic or Arc Antarctica? It involves a lot of um, support, like mobilization, mobilization. So in any way, I went to Aral Sea. Once a sea, it has become salt bed. Salt bed. The helicopter should fly a little bit higher, not to have a trouble. Because when it go, flies lower, then all this salt will affect this uh, water. I went to Lake Chad. Once like a sea, it has become a small pond in just 30 years. Aral Sea, in just 40 years, because of the Soviet Union's mismanagement, this sea has become just a salt bed. Once a sea. Aral Sea, can you believe? If you go now to um, Amazon River Basin, you will see a rampant deforestation. 500 year old, uh, big the trees, maybe cut just a few hundred dollars. Just a, because they have to leave. All these ind indigenous people, local people, have to make their own living. If you go to Indonesia, DRC, rampant deforestation. So these are the lungs of our, of our world. These lungs are now being you know, spoiled and destroyed. So I, I've been always speaking out, standing on the Arctic ice, on the frozen, frozen ice, this Aral Sea and Lake Chad, my, my appeal and voice has been heard cloud, uh, loud and widely, clearly. People have come to realize that there is a climate change happening. The President Bush, the former President Bush, uh, uh, Junior Bush, it took a long time for me to convince him. I don't know why all Republican presidents are making uh, this. 
I was able to convince him. I'm very grateful. I met him last year in Florida, and I really expressed my deepest thanks to him. But my deepest, more deepest thanks go to, should go to President Obama, President Obama, who has really shown such a great support, and President Xi Jinping of China. Without China's getting on board, it would never happen. America, you know what, they were on board, but America and United China getting together, it has a much, much powerful political message. People were sure that we will be able to address the climate change. And so it's very important now. That's what I was able to have climate change agreement. Yeah. So students, go join the Aganis Arena and uh, go to the gym so you can learn how to twist some arms. Uh, so we'll take a, a couple questions. Uh, I'll take a, a few of them at, at a time. We'll, we'll just, we only have time for about three questions. So we'll take three questions, and then we'll ask the Secretary General to do so. And so uh, the Secretary General can get to know you. Please, uh, please tell us your name. The first one will be from an undergraduate. I'd like to see a hand, hand from an undergrad. Please introduce yourself. And <clears throat> yes, I'm sorry, we have a microphone. Hi, um, my name is Grace Han Yang, and um, I'm a junior studying health science in Sargent. And my question is, um, throughout your entire address, there was a motif of partnership. And um, so, but through this um, highly polarized political climate, um, where there is a lack of genuine and constructive dialogue, um, how do you suggest that we can instigate, encourage, and sustain um, conversation and um, conversation and dialogue and partnership. Yeah. I'll take, I'll, I'll take uh, a handful and let uh, you okay. answer them. Uh, okay, let, let us have our partnership. Okay. Now, second. Uh, a, well, a graduate student, please. Sir, I'll get to this side of the room for the other two. Hi, um, this is actually from my friend Khadija. She's kind of starstruck to be here. Um, so she's asking that... Well, tell us who she is and tell us who you are. Uh, Khadija Noor, she is, uh, we're both in the... I mean, you can ask the question now. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm usually very shy, but you said that young people are the next leaders of our world. But most of the world's uh, youth are living in poverty and have no voice. I was recently at the youth assembly. You just close to a microphone. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so you said that young people are the next leaders of our world, but most of the world's youth are living in poverty and have no voice. I was recently at the youth assembly at the UN in New York, and going to BU, I realized that only the privileged young are able to be leaders. How can we incorporate the youth in poverty to have their voices heard? Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have to go to, to this side. We'll uh, go to a faculty member. Any faculty members on this side with their hands up? Sir. Um, what more can the UN... I'm sorry, we need your microphone and, and introduce yourself to us. Uh, Michael Greenwald, uh, graduate of Pardee as well as the law school and teaching a counter-terrorist financing class. Mm -hmm. Speak close. Yeah, yeah. Sure, Michael Greenwald, uh, graduate of Party as well as the law school, uh, teaching a class now at Party. Um, I worked at the Treasury Department for 10 years, and we worked very closely with the UN on domestic and international sanctions issues. What more can the UN do as a body to create more bite in sanctions? Because you've, you've overseen the development of sanctions and how they're effective and how they're not effective. Uh, but what more can the UN do? Terrific. OK, there you yeah. go. See? This world is definitely divided. And our society is divided. So look, it seems that it will be quite difficult to forge a partnership in such a and atmospheres. Uh, people are fighting, there are so many refugees, and uh, people, there are so many people who need support. In such a case, how can and who can be part of this partnership? The government uh, should really take a very 
strong political leadership and initiative and incentives uh, to uh, business communities. And business communities can always be a greater source of uh, support in terms of mobilizing uh, financing. And there are also great role, greater role by the civil society. Therefore, partnership should always be triangular. Government, business communities, and civil society. You will be very much uh, grateful to know that there are many civil society, or non-profit organization, just small and big, organized by just the civil society. Then much greater role should be played by business communities. It's not the government, but the most of the money are in the hands of uh, uh, private the companies, the private sector, private sectors. Uh, there are huge uh, global global companies uh, which really generate uh, billions of, uh, sometimes uh, trillions of uh, dollars, like uh, insurance companies or pension fund. And there are many such, uh, uh, such you know, institutions which can really be uh, able to play important role in uh, strengthening our partnership. As I said, that we still have a lot of divisions, uh, political divisions and uh, physical divisions. The United Nations should be very united. When, when I say the United Nations is not united, we can not play any longer constructive role. So it is important that United Nations, member states, they should show sense of unity. Largely, the Security Council is uh, divided on most of the cases between United States and Russia or European, United, European Union and United States versus Russia again. So it's uh, said that in, on most of the cases in dealing with the Syrian crisis, the Russians, uh, most of they've been uh, vetoing or even humanitarian uh, resolutions. It always uh, takes time. And therefore, I'm urging the sense of unity among government, the civil society, and uh, the business communities will be a key in forging a greater uh, partnership. Now, the role of uh, youth, uh, again, the, when so many people are still suffering from poverty, uh, extreme poverty, uh, then it will be very difficult for young people living in those uh, areas, in those countries. And that's why it's very generous and compassionate support from a developed world, like OECD countries, will be very important. There should be equal opportunities for those young people living in developed world or affluent societies, together with the, those young people living in poor countries. Simply because they are poor, if they are not given opportunities equally, then what kind of a role do we expect from them in the future? When they are not educated, they are not uh, trained, they are not uh, supported, they are not employed, then the opportunities always be, will be lost. It's injustice to them. That's why we must do much, much more for youth in developing worlds. Developing world. Third question about the sanctions regime. There have been many sanction measures taken by the United Nations. When there are perpetrators, violators of rules and regulations in your society, they are punished. They are punished in your society. When either they are being put into jail or whatever, uh, maybe. But in the, United, in the international community, the problem is that 
there is not much coercive for measures. For example, United Nations, when the peacekeepers make a certain uh, you know, crimes, commit crimes, then United Nations do not have any authority to punish them. We don't have a court except the courts established for special purposes by the decision of the Security Council. So they deal only those issues. If any United Nations staff makes a crime, then we have no other way but to repatriate these people to their own home country and ask them to punish according to their own domestic laws, regulations. If they don't take action, then we have no other way but to just follow up. We ask them to take a punishment. Now, sanction measures are a little bit different again. Sanctions are made by the Security Council and urge and ask the member states to comply with, comply with and support. When the member state concern is not complying with this resolution, there may not be any punitive measures, coercive measures. That's what is happening to North Korea. We don't have any punitive measures against North Korea. We cannot use any force. We cannot put them in a jail, except we put some people, individuals, on sanction list. So whenever they travel somewhere, they will be prohibited from entry, etc. Now, the <coughs> sanction measures imposed against North Korea seem to be working gradually with the greater sense of abiding by these Security Council resolutions. Countries in the neighboring neighbors, like including China, they are cooperating. Uh, European countries, they are cooperating. I'm sure that these sanction measures are biting, biting North Korea. If South Africa used to be one heavily sanctioned, not because of this uh, uh, nuclear, but because of their racial discrimination. They were even suspended their membership, and later they, they fully abided by the Security Council sanction and restored their membership and got their, all these regime changes uh, from the uh, colonial, colonial regime. Now South Africans are there, uh, they're on their own independent uh, state. So sometimes it, it worked, sometimes it has not been working. Therefore, it requires full participation, full support of each and every member state. If a member state does not cooperate, the United Nations cannot uh, enforce it. That's the limit of the United Nations. It's not like a state authority. Well, we only have a little bit of time for one more question, and I'm going to ask it. But I know it's one that, uh, I know it's one that everyone here wants to know here at BU. Uh, just about everyone here at BU wants to be you. They, uh, they, they either f literally want to, those who are at the party school, they want to go and be global diplomatic leaders at the highest level. And whether you're an engineer or an English major, they want to reach the pinnacle of their possible professional capabilities. And yeah, yeah. Can you share a personal insight and, and, uh, and give these folks advice, uh, both the students of how they can achieve the best of their ability and, and those of us who are professors on how we can enable these folks to do that? It's true that uh, everybody, particularly young people, have passion and their dreams, bigger dreams, to reach a pinnacle of uh, whichever professions you may be uh, trying to uh, do. The, I'll just say one uh, in a metaphor. Uh, when I entered the middle school, the principal of my middle school uh, told us that uh, you uh, young, young students, he said that uh, put your head above the cloud, but at the same time put your two feet firmly grounded on the, on the ground. 
So it's not possible. How can you have your head above the crowd <laughs> while standing on the ground? But that means you have higher ideals and bigger and ambitious dreams. But that does not always make you achieve your dreams. You have to be very practical and realistic. So it means that you have to really understand where you are placed yourself. So make yourself the firmly grounded on, on, the, on your feet, two feet. Then one may go even faster, but it's up to you how to regulate your speed. Just to go up the ladder, up the steps, one by one, one by one. And this is, has been guiding, guiding uh, you know, uh, line for me during the last uh, uh, 70 some years, uh, 70 some years. Well, thank it you. may apply to you, it may not apply to you. you one, some of you may be more ambitious than others. Some of you may take another way or a faster way, but it's up to you. But it's important that you need to be a global, a global citizen, have a global vision, and think about others. Instead of, uh, you are just one of uh, one, one member of a bigger society. If your bigger society does not go together and prosper, you will have less opportunities, much, much less and less opportunities. It's important that we work together as a community members, as a team, and move together. But there will be somebody who will go faster or slower. That depends upon you know, the situation and depends upon individual. Uh, for me, as a person, it's also important uh, before you claim your own rights or your uh, vision, then just to think about others. So that's what I have always been uh, trying to do. Uh, there is a clearly some difference between the people who are coming from Western world and Eastern world uh, who have been uh, influenced by Confucianism or Buddhism or some Christianity. There are some, some differences, but basically we are same human being. There should be a genuine and deeper appreciation of the culture of the others and the situation of the others then only then you will become a global citizen instead of you just insist on your own uh, vision. That's what I'm, I can tell you at this time. Thank you. I, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Before we say a final round of thank yous to Secretary General and Madam Yu for coming here with us, I just have to thank all the people that made this great event happen. I really want to thank the uh, Office of BU Research, Gloria Waters and her staff, John Martins and, and uh, Kat, uh, Dar, Bob, uh, the Department uh, Development and Alumni Relations, Bob and, and Sarah, uh, my staff at the GDP Center, Bill Kring, Rebecca Cowing, and especially Isabel Alvarez Medina and the Dean's Ambassadors of the Party School that helped you get in here so orderly. I really appreciate all the help. Uh, this, uh, this couldn't have been done by, by one person by any stretch of the imagination. But please help me in thanking uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon for spending the day with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank you.